Hi, everyone. It seems like uh, our um, panel is being populated by the audience members. I just wanted to um, welcome you and introduce you to the panelists. Thank you so much for everyone um, joining in to the Center for Ethics and Human Values uh, conversations around research ethics panels. This is our first one that we're doing via Zoom, so bear with us. We're going to be talking about the obviously timely issue of the ethics of regulation of clinical trials for COVID-19 treatments. And these conversations are basically um, opportunities for members of um, the Ohio State University to come into conversation about deeper issues related to ethics of research with human subjects that go beyond just the regulatory um, questions and IRB oversight. Um, this is sponsored by um, the Ohio State University Office of Research. It's supported by the Center for Bioethics in the College of Medicine and the College of Public Health. Um, and I am, uh, my name is Dana Howard. I'm going to be the mon uh, moderator. And I'm uh, part of the Center for Bioethics in the College of Medicine and the Philosophy Department at The Ohio State. Um, we're very lucky to have um, three esteemed panelists, Alex uh, John London, who is the Clara West Professor of Ethics and Philosophy and the Director for the Center of Ethics and Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, he is a leading expert on the ethics of human subjects research and particularly in public health emergencies such as Ebola and now um, issues surrounding the coronavirus. He's going to be speaking for around 10 minutes to really frame the discussion. And then afterwards, we're going to be opening it up to a preset set of questions that we um, devised as a group um, with the other two OSU panelists. And then the last 20 minutes, we're going to be um, keeping it open for audience questions. So please, um, at the bottom of your screen, you see the Q&A uh, button. Please, throughout the whole conversation, if you have any questions, we're going to be um, taking on a list of questions there, and we'll have plenty of time at the end, the last 20 minutes, to discuss it. Um, we also have um, uh, Patricia Zettler, Patty Zettler, who is Assistant Professor of Law at The Ohio State University, Moritz, Moritz College of Law, and she's also the member of The Ohio State Drug Enforcement and Policy Center and a uh, the Comprehensive Cancer Center. And her expertise is on um, regulation of medicine, drugs, and tobacco products, and also on issues of expanded access to investigational drugs, which is something that hopefully we'll have time to discuss today. And we also have uh, Dona Omahuna, who is Associate Professor in the College of Nursing, and his um, expertise lies in the ethics of research on disasters and humanitarian crises. So, um, a variety of clinical trials have been initiated at warp speed. We've been reading about it in the news. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, evidence that is coming out there, but researchers, regulators, healthcare professionals, and the public don't really know what to do with it and how to judge it um, and whether to use it in their practice. So hopefully this panel is going to really clarify some of the ethical issues, and I'm excited to cede the floor to Alex, who is going to frame the discussion for us. Thanks, Dana. I can't uh, share until you unshare. Okay, so I'm going to unshare. And stop sharing. <laughs> All right. Okay, um, uh, it's, um, it's thanks to the organizers uh, for having me here. Um, it's, um, uh, it's daunting not to be able to you know, give a talk and not be able to see, knowing that there's 146 people watching, not be able to see you. Um, but uh, I'll do my best to get things started. Um, uh, I wanna frame the discussion uh, around an issue that uh, has always struck me as paradoxical and in particular particularly paradoxical when we're talking about research in a public health crisis and that is that uh, ultimately what we want to do with research is to reduce uncertainty um, 
But in order to reduce uncertainty with research, uh, we have to take steps to preserve it in a particular sort of way. So I want to try to make sense of what it, uh, it, it, the sense in which it, we have to preserve uncertainty in order to reduce it. Um, in particular, public health emergencies are a volatile mix of uncertainty and urgency, and nobody likes uncertainty even in the best of times. So how we deal with it um, has profound uh, ethical implications, in part because uncertainty is the foundation uh, for ethical research. And there are two ways in which um, uh, we can uh, try to address uncertainty in ways that are um, uh, going to be problematic. So I'm going to talk about two of those today. One is I will call myopic decision making. And then the other um, happens when we take uncert uh, urgency to justify reducing the quality of the studies uh, that we put into the field, uh, you know, where we're motivated to try to generate evidence very quickly. So um, by myopic decision making, I mean the idea that um, randomized clinical trials are in some way inconsistent with the clinician's duty to care uh, in a crisis situation. So this is myopic decision making in the sense that the individual clinician says, I've got to, I've got to act now, uh, make the best use of the information that's available to me, and uh, that is inconsistent with clinical trial participation. Uh, this was a position that we saw articulated pretty robustly during the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. Um, it's, it's had less, it's garnered less um, attention. It's, had, it's, it's been a smaller fraction of the public debate uh, around uh, the coronavirus. Uh, however, here's a quote from the profile of uh, Dieter Raut that just appeared uh, in New York Times, where he says, uh, we're not going to tell someone, listen, today's uh, not your lucky day. Uh, you're getting the placebo. You're going to be dying. Um, then the reporter says he believes it to be uh, unnecessary in addition to being unethical to run randomized controlled trials uh, of treatments for deadly infectious diseases. So my problem with this um, position um, is that it's self-defeating. And I, I want to just try to briefly go through why I think that is, even though I've ar argued for this at length um, elsewhere. But basically, um, um, the focus on the duty of the individual caregiver really obscures the social nature of the uncertainty surrounding uh, the interventions in question, disagreement in the expert medical community, what that means for patients, and how research is supposed to address all of those things. So, um, in effect, um, what you have in this situation is you have some experts who um, are convinced uh, when they look at the available evidence that a particular treatment uh, could be hyd hydroxychloroquine or some treatment involving hydroxychloroquine in this case. Um, so you have some people who are convinced that this is the right thing to do. They feel like they have an ethical duty to provide it to their patients. You have other uh, clinicians uh, who look at the same evidence uh, and they're not persuaded. Uh, so they don't think that the evidence rises to the point where they have a duty uh, to provide this to their patients. So in this situation now, you have some people who are prescribed and receive uh, that intervention, and you have other people who don't. And the problem is this happens in a context in which it's difficult to learn. You have some people who receive the drug, some people who don't, but in a context where there's lots of confounding. In a randomized clinical trial, uh, you have effectively the same distribution in the sense that some people receive the drug and other people don't. But the uncertainty or disagreement in the community ensures that everybody who participates in this study receives an intervention that would be recommended for them by an informed expert. But they receive these interventions in a context where randomization creates independence right, between uh, a bunch of the features that um, uh, patients have and the outcomes that, that we receive, uh, that we um, uh, perceive or measure. So we can control confounding and we can promote learning. So my worry about this myopic approach is that it sort of cuts our nose off to spite our face. Refusing to conduct a randomized clinical trial doesn't make anybody better off because we still have some people receiving the intervention, some people not, but it leaves many stakeholders worse off because we're not generating the evidence that we need in order to know whether these interventions really work. And so whether we really ought to be providing them to more people or whether we shouldn't be doing that because they don't help 
or they possibly hurt, or they're, they're a, a, a poor use of um, scarce resources. Okay, so the, the next um, way of addressing research that can be problematic um, uh, is when we think, well, uh, we need to hurry up and put studies into the field, um, even if they lack some of the virtues that we want out of uh, well-designed clinical trials. So um, I actually like this uh, paper by Kim and colleagues uh, very much because uh, it's critical. Um, it provides a nice critical analysis of the, the, the study by um, Raut and colleagues. But I was really struck by the sentence when I read it. They say, given the urgency of the situation, some limitations in study design may be acceptable, including small sample size, use of an unvalidated surrogate endpoint, at lack of randomization or blinding. And you know, when I read that, I thought, well, what's left? Uh, I mean, most of those are the things uh, that we use to give, uh, to ensure that results are, are, are credible and informative. So, um, you know, uh, poor quality studies, um, you know, have a problem in the sense that clinically meaningful effects are rarely silver bullets. So when we say, well, let's put a study out there and we'll see, you know, we'll, we'll look in the, the formulary, we'll see if any of the things we have laying around might be treatments. We design um, small studies uh, to detect really large effects. You're pretty confident going into this that you're not going to see that kind of uh, effect because silver bullets are very rare. Penicillin-like effects are very rare. So a study like that, when it has a negative result, it's expected and it's not very informative because you then you say, well, uh, it's very likely that uh, it's, it's possible that there still is a clinically meaningful effect. We just didn't power our study to detect it. Also, small uncontrolled trials often show uh, misleading uh, signals uh, of promise. And we know they're misleading because when we subject the same intervention to uh, you know, more critical testing in a larger, uh, well-designed study, uh, then the positive signal disappears. So when you run studies like this, small, uncontrolled trials or trials that are designed underpowered, they're designed to detect really large effects, then um, when, they are, when they are concluded, stakeholders are left to read the tea leaves, as it were. That is to say, they're left to try to make sense uh, of, um, of what these inconclusive results actually mean. And so as a result, proponents of the intervention uh, can often find something that supports their position. Uh, skeptics or critics of the intervention can also find something that supports uh, um, uh, their position. But the concern here is that some evidence now can actually be worse than no evidence if that evidence is misleading. In particular, if it shifts practice behavior without proper warrant, um, also if it shifts patient preferences without uh, evidence of benefit, then it doesn't necessarily make patients better off. Um, so we don't know whether uh, giving the treatments are, are the right thing to do in order to discharge our duty to patients. We don't know whether uh, 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 from the health system standpoint that making available and providing those interventions is an effective and efficient use of scarce resources. But to the extent that people's views have become uh, more solidified or more polarized, then it can actually be an impediment to conducting the kind of studies that we need in order to uh, detect the presence or absence of a meaningful uh, clinical effect. And to some degree, I think we're seeing some of this uh, um, uh, come to bear with hydroxychloroquine. So uh, there was a boom period uh, in which um, uh, leaders had sort of uh, really gotten out behind it as very promising. And um, I think it was uh, easier to recruit in the clinical trials at that point, but you also had a lot of people um, going around clinical trials and seeking off-label prescription of that drug. Um, or those combinations of drugs. Uh, and then um, there was a bust period. So this Seattle Times headline says, clinical trial enrollment plummets as volunteers are scared off of coronavirus drug promoted by Trump. Um, so here now, um, patients are avoiding uh, randomized clinical trials out of a fear of being exposed to a toxic intervention uh, where um, they think there might be um, a little prospect of uh, clinical benefit. So um, it, when I talk about preserving uncertainty, then what I mean is we have to do a better job um, 
of admitting when we lack uh, credible evidence, uh, communicating to the larger public that we lack credible evidence, recognizing when there is reasoned disagreement, and then using that as the occasion to conduct properly controlled studies uh, as the method for assessing these interventions in a manner that's designed to generate the evidence that we need and that's sufficient to resolve that uncertainty and reduce that disagreement so that we can reduce unnecessary variation in practice and move uh, clinical practice in a, uh, forward in a way that is more effective and hopefully therefore also more efficient. So I really do think it's a false dichotomy uh, to say that either we act on available evidence now or we wait for research to generate better evidence. Um, the reason I think this is a, a false dichotomy is that research itself is a responsible means of responding to uncertainty within the confines of a properly conducted, properly controlled clinical trial. Participants can access uh, potential interventions but they can access them under the conditions that will control for uh, confounding. Um, so we can learn whether these things actually do what we hope that they do or whether they don't and we should leave them behind. And in the presence of clinical equipoise, no participant receives a level of care that falls below what would be recommended for them by at least a reasonable minority of expert clinicians. So in that sense, um, inside a properly designed, and ethically conducted clinical trial, um, we're not sacrificing the interests of any participants. We're being able to deliver uh, novel interventions, but also deliver them under conditions where we can assess their merits and then either adopt them or reject them uh, afterwards. I'll just conclude then. Um, I won't dwell on these points, um, you know, because I've already probably you know, taken up the, the time allotted for the introduction, but I just wanna say, I think even in the context of a, a public health crisis, you know, the National Academy Committee that uh, wrote the report uh, on the Ebola trials effectively said, um, you know, we, we've gotta conduct well-designed clinical trials. Uh, there are many, I think that message is a common theme in the response to prior outbreaks. Um, so it's important that research, we remember that the, the underlying justification for research is its social value. Uh, and we have to design trials that are gonna promote that value. So they've gotta address key evidence gaps. Uh, they have to uh, look at questions uh, that are meaningful in terms of changing practice within the community of practitioners and health systems. We want them to be designed around uh, clinically meaningful questions so that positive results will be informative, but also so that negative results are informative. So if you see that um, uh, a, a trial does its job and shows you that an intervention uh, doesn't have uh, uh, the effect that you are looking for, um, that that's informative. Um, we also have to ensure that we have pre-specified designs that our analyses are carried out in accordance with those designs, but also that our reporting of these studies in the media, that our relationship with the media um, uh, reflect the reporting of results in a proper context so that we don't, we can avoid this binary of it works or it doesn't works uh, or it doesn't work. And we get this seesaw uh, between, um, you know, uh, this is a panacea uh, and this is a poison. And the last thing I'll, I'll say uh, is, you know, um, yes, uh, the question now is how do we do this in a way that's feasible? And, you know, I think, uh, and you know, what Jonathan Kimmelman and I uh, argued in our recent paper is that um, we shouldn't try to approach the question of feasibility by reducing the merits of the studies that we're putting into the field. We should try to approach the question of feasibility by promoting cooperation and collaboration. People have to move outside of the silos uh, that they're used to working in uh, so that we can have um, larger studies with more sites that will recruit more quickly and answer questions more quickly, rather than a proliferation of independent sites carrying out studies that may or may not recruit and that will take a long time uh, to give us the answer and that potentially duplicate effort. And with that, uh, I will stop talking. Dana, you're muted.
Hi. So I'm going to open the conversation with some preset questions that uh, the panelists and I came up with, but um, I've already seen that some people are uh, asking questions in the Q&A. Please continue to do so throughout the conversation. And in about 20 minutes, we're going to op be opening that up for discussion. Um, so uh, hopefully now, um, so maybe I'll ask all the panelists to unmute themselves so that you can respond. Um, so I think that um, Alex just compellingly argued against um, research exceptionalism in public health crises such as these. I just wanted to invite um, Donal and Patty to share their own thoughts about maybe there are some acceptable changes to either the way that um, uh, there should be ethical or regulatory oversight uh, for clinical research around COVID-19. Perhaps given the pandemic, there should actually be extra protections for human subjects or for the public or for the researchers. So this is just an opportunity to think about, you know, is this context special or unique in any way? And does it require a special kind of response um, from ethical oversight or from regulatory oversight? And I'll start with Patty um, and then we'll move on to Donal. Yeah, thanks, Dana, and thanks, Alex, for that great presentation. I'm um, delighted to be here and appreciate um, CEHV uh, uh, putting this together, and thank you to all the participants for being here. Like Alex, I wish we could be in person. Um, so in terms of potential changes to ethical or regulatory oversight of clinical research, I, uh, I know it's slightly boring when panelists agree with each other, but I sort of am 100% on board with Alex's um, arguments against, uh, you know, what he calls research um, or, or pandemic research exceptionalism. Um, and, you know, I approach this as a lawyer and sort of thinking about this from the FDA regulatory perspective. Um, even though I 100% agree with that, I don't think that necessarily means there's no room for change to regulation of clinical research. Um, so, I mean, I guess my position would be, I think the changes we need are not related to the purpose of the regulations, which are intended both to protect human subjects, but also to ensure rigorous scientific design and data validity. I think those goals, for the reasons Alex explained, remain critical. Um, but there are, I think, ways we can rethink approaches to research regulation that might make sense. Um, you know, some changes might need to be made in order to um, you know, lower risks of research, for example, we probably don't want participants signing informed consent documents if they're um, currently infectious, you know, in person, right? So there are, there are those kinds of changes that can, could be made. Um, and if there are ways to make regulation more efficient that we discover right now, that could be, you know, that might present an opportunity to think about how to make regulation more efficient for all research, not just research right now in the pandemic. Um, FDA actually has released quite a bit of guidance um, around some of these questions about, you know, how to make research in sort of remote ways or virtual ways work better, um, or how to satisfy regulatory obligations in ways that lower risks to researchers and participants. But it was sort of a long-winded way of saying, I don't, think, I don't think there's any reason to change the purpose of regulation, which is, again, protecting subjects and ensuring rigorous design and data validity but there might be things we learned through the pandemic about how to make regulation more efficient. Thank you, Patty. Donald, do you have um, either competing thoughts or uh, shared views? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. And uh, thanks for the invitation to be here and for Alex giving us a really uh, excellent presentation and for, for Patty's uh, initial reactions. Uh, I guess I, I echo Patty's uh, kind of uh, um, reluctance to agree with uh, with lots of things throughout the panel, but um, I do agree with many of the general principles. And so I think we we have to keep pushing for high quality research uh, that will provide the best possible evidence that uh, is going to guide clinicians and patients because they're the ones literally on the front lines trying to make the best possible decisions. And when you just don't know whether one thing is more effective or possibly even of greater concern, more harmful, then you, you have to uh, be uh, pushing for the high quality 
rigorous types of designs that are, uh, are necessary. Where I, I think there's a clear uh, need for things to be done differently would be in terms of the, the efficiency and the, the speed of review and design and, and that level of things that, you know, when, when you do a uh, review of, of protocols or work on, on uh, research design and things like that in, uh, in normal circumstances, you often have, you know, weeks to, to, to react and provide information and feedback. Um, in, in that area, things need to change, I think, to, to adapt for the, the urgency. Uh, but not in terms of the, the rigor of the studies that are, that are involved. Um, I, I would kind of highlight that while we are talking about randomized controlled trials for the effectiveness and um, you know, safety of, of drugs, that there are many other types of uh, trials that need to be done to report on uh, different types of research questions that are being asked. So it doesn't mean that these are the only sorts of research that, that need to be done. And I think you can see where uh, the standard approach to everything often isn't going to be enough. So uh, with uh, uh, some, some colleagues that I've been involved with looking at the case reports coming out uh, in the literature, a different type of uh, study, um, but the, what seems to have happened is there's been a standard approach to reporting the symptoms that has just gone on for months and months. And so with that, you're not getting some of the new information added, such as questions that came up about the impact of COVID-19 on uh, patient smell and taste. And those are not being mentioned because there hasn't been an adaption to the sort of standard list of symptoms that has been uh, collected. So those sorts of changes are needed. And even with the design of randomized controlled trials, I think one of the, the, the probably the biggest COVID-19 trial underway at the moment is the one sponsored by the WHO, the World Health Organization. And it's using an adaptive trial design and that's where uh, researchers have listened to the concerns of participants and clinicians and seen that things can be designed so can be done differently, but within a rigorous parameters, set of parameters, where you pre-design flexibility into your study. And that's the sort of change that we need that falls within the rigor but produces useful evidence as quickly as possible um, and then distributes it to uh, ultimately to clinicians and patients as quickly as possible. Thank you. And so this is a big picture question for all the panelists. I mean, if, what is your biggest ethical worry about the current state of the clinical trials related to COVID-19? And I'll start with Alex and then Patty and Donal, you can uh, chime in after that. Um, so uh, I'm not sure I have a, a, a biggest, but I mean, other, so some of the concerns about um, uh, whether the first out of the gate studies have had the quality that we need. Um, so, and that they've been able to then, um, you know, go to preprint servers, um, uh, be reported by, you know, the New York Times ran a piece about a study uh, where there was no mention of the fact that if you went and looked at the pre-registration for the study, um, you know, uh, there were, um, the design was different. Uh, it, was, it was, there were more arms in the pre-registration. The outcomes were different than what were reported. These would have all been in, been real red flags. Um, so not only is it the, the, the quality of the studies that are done, getting them out so early, the reporting of stuff from preprint archives, um, and then also just the, the sheer volume, the duplication of, of work. Um, what's going to happen, you know, uh, I mean, at some point, are DSMBs looking at all these studies that are, you know, uh, that are going to be initiated on these similar hypotheses? And are there going to be some of these studies that are planned that uh, aren't going to take place later on? Um, you know, would we have done a, would we have be in a better situation uh, if instead of having so many parallel studies, uh, you know, um, looking at very similar hypotheses, uh, if we had, um, you know, uh, more, more consolidation 
uh, so that we had more groups that whose research was being conducted under the same sort of umbrella, like the large scale, um, you know, WHO study. So I think, you know, the lack of cooperation, right, fragmentation, I don't know what the plan is for, um, you know, uh, coordinating, you know, and integrating the data from all these different trials. So Patty, um, I'm muted mute to you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I, um, again, I think I, I share Alex's view largely. I mean, I think, um, you know, there are lots of ethical concerns to think about, of course, but ensuring that studies are designed and conducted in ways that produce useful information and not, as Alex said, just some sort of a, a one-off, but that we're not duplicating efforts, um, I think is, um, is sort of the key question here um, and sort of a key challenge because it's not the way we're used to thinking about research um, as a more sort of collaborative or open process across um, you know, the country and the world in a way that, that we haven't typically thought about it. Um, and yeah, so I think, I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and pass to Donal. Um, I, I guess I, I maybe just raised a couple of other points that just because they haven't come up so far, um, but I think one of the things with the, the emphasis or the, the media coverage that's happening that you're, you're in way ahead of the normal situation that applies. And so it's, I think everybody needs to remember that the normal drug development and approval process um, starts with a fairly like a large number of potential drugs um, that are being tested but by the time you actually get through all of the safety and the efficacy uh, checking and uh, the, the research process you typically eliminate the majority the vast majority of those potential uh, drugs and are left with a relatively small number and as we get the media um, engagement with the, you know, the earliest of possibilities that seem to be working out well, um, I think we sometimes forget that there's an awful lot of things are going to fall by the wayside as research continues. And through that, I think we're creating some um, kind of uh, unrealistic expectations around what, uh, how, well, how soon and uh, what sorts of things are actually going to be beneficial. And the result of that is that, or one of the, the points is that what we see at the moment where one of the, um, the, uh, the potential candidates was an arthritis drug uh, or approved for arthritis. And all of a sudden there were questions about whether those patients currently on that drug would be able to get the drug um, and uh, because it was being brought into experimental or off-label use um, in, uh, in, in COVID-19. And you similarly have questions around hydroxychloroquine, which is used by uh, malaria patients. Um, again, the, the movement of things into the research and uh, end of things, given how the large scale of the pandemic and the relative scarcity of some of these uh, drugs means that there are going to be shortages in other areas. And so it's not, uh, it, it's not a simple thing of just collecting um, potential drugs and testing them. There are implications if false um, you know, leads are being followed and, um, and, and those are based more on media than uh, science or evidence to support their use. So one thing we've talked about a little bit is the importance of randomized control trials or just sort of uh, even with adaptive trials, the importance of retaining um, research integrity when it comes to the trials. Um, so I, I, one question that has actually come up already in the, um, from the audience by uh, Katie Spector Baghdadi is just what, if we think that randomized control trials are um, required or, or uh, ethically appropriate, um, which we tend to think, um, what should the control arm be? And as new evidence comes in, 
um, should we change what the control arm is, even if that isn't sufficient enough data um, for thinking that it would be standard of care without, not in the sort of um, context of a clinical trial. So um, why don't I start with Alex, um, and then we could open it up to discussion. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's hard to talk about specifics. Um, you know, in, in the question, um, you know, Kate asked about uh, the remdesivir trial, um, which we don't know that much about unless it, it's been reported. Well, I haven't been looking. Um, and, you know, so I think the concern there is with the change in endpoint and residual uncertainty about you know, uh, whether the, the drug has a, a net impact on um, mortality, um, then whether it was appropriate to say, um, well, it should become the control now uh, in, in that trial. And, and here, you know, so, um, you know, all I can give is what I would take to be sort of the, the, the ethical formula for answering that question, which is, you know, if the evidence that we have at this interim analysis isn't sufficient to persuade clinicians um, that remdesivir provides a, uh, a survival advantage to patients, then it seems to me that it's not unethical, so it is ethical, <laughs> to continue uh, to randomize, um, you know, people to remdesivir, placebo, or uh, the, other, um, the other intervention uh, that's in the trial. Um, so I, I think this gets back to but we don't, I don't. I don't know. You know. Maybe when we see all the data and we see what what further evidence there 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 is there, that would change my mind. But I. Uh, but I think this is this speaks to the importance of you know having a clear sense of what are the clinically meaningful um, uh, considerations that are really going to go in the community to the use of this intervention, and making sure that our trials are designed to provide us evidence about those things. Yeah. I. Um... I think FDA has said in guidance, I want to say it was last week, but time's a bit fuzzy right now, um, that, uh, that, that the control arm should be the quote standard of care, but you know, we don't, but what does that mean, right? Um, and here I think communicating and understanding what regulatory decisions have meant is really critical. So remdesivir is being distributed under an emergency use authorization from FDA, which the legal standard for FDA issuing an emergency use authorization is much lower than an approval. An emergency use authorization or an EUA is not an approval. It's that there's, I can't remember the exact statutory language off the top of my head, uh, but it's, you know, there's reason to believe the drug may be effective, right? So that's much lower than we, what we normally expect. And, you know, some would argue we don't normally expect enough evidence either. But um, so we sh I don't think we should automatically think because something has an EUA from FDA that it is the standard of care. You know, we should understand that that's not the same as an approval and, you know, we shouldn't give it the same weight as an approval. Yeah, I would say that the, st the, the comparison varies with what uh, what we already know. When you have a standard drug that is effective for a particular disease or, or uh, condition, um, then you don't want to give um, you know somebody a placebo to test something new against that. You would take the, the drug that's approved and known to be effective and safe, and then you compare the new one against that. We're in a different situation now because we, we, as far as we know, we don't have anything effective that specifically treats COVID-19. And so using a placebo, uh, or sorry, the standard of care, uh, which, uh, you know, again, it, it's, a, it's somewhat unclear, uh, but if that was a, a placebo intervention, um, then that can be ethically justified. What I think is one of the, the nice things with the World Health Organization trial, which is, is called Solidarity, uh, is that they have five arms in it at the moment. So there are four different drug interventions. Remdesivir is one of them, but they're testing others and, and uh, different combinations. And they have also built in the, the ability to say that if the uh, data coming out shows that one of these one of these drugs or combinations is harmful, 
it can be stopped rather than having to wait, you know, six months before you then evaluate that, oh, wow, it's, it's really harmful. And likewise, they can also add in an extra arm with a new agent if somehow evidence starts to, to come up that uh, something else should be tested rather than waiting a year before you set up a, a new trial to include that arm. And so I think that's one of the advantages at the moment is there is this flexibility to change as the data changes so rapidly. Um, and I, I think that's part of the flexibility that we have learned about because of the, the tragedy of the uh, Ebola outbreak in, in West Africa and the learning that went in at that point uh, into trial design. So one final question for the panelists, um, and then we're going to just open it up to the many excellent questions that have already come up, is um, about challenge trials. So should challenge trials for vaccines which recruit healthy volunteers and expose them to the virus be per permitted given the lack of treatment options? Um, and then are there any regulatory considerations when it comes to the acceptability of a challenge trial um, when it uh, yeah, so that's uh, so. Why don't I start with Patty on some of the ethical regulatory issues, and then I'll open it up for um, Alex and Donald. Uh, sure. I, you know, I actually would defer to Alex and and Donald on this. Um, but I mean, I guess I'll say, you know, from a regulatory perspective or sort of from an approval perspective, right? FDA is going to want to be sure that the clinical trial regulation requirements are followed and that there's that the challenge trial presents you know good evidence that the product works or it's designed to produce you know well designed to produce that kind of evidence but um, you know I'll, I'll defer to uh, my our, our ethics panelists on some of the, the stickier ethical questions Alex so I, I, I could, we could do a much, we could do a longer, a whole thing on just this question. My, my, my short answer here to try to also put this sort of in the context of, of some of the things that Donal has been, uh, has been saying, um, I, I think um, there's been too much attention on the way that a challenge study will shorten one small aspect of a much broader development timeline. And um, because we, we, we not only need to know that the vaccine provides a protective effect, but we have to know that it's safe. If we're gonna give this vaccine to uh, hundreds of millions, perhaps a billion people, rare events are, are really going to matter. And so I think if the idea is that we're going to um, speed the development by uh, truncating the amount of safety studies that we do, I think that's a very different question than the use of the, the challenge study. Um, the uh, traditional design, an adaptive design, looking at multiple vaccine candidates at the same time, I think would also speed the development timeline, but it would generate a much broader bandwidth of information because we're, um, we want to know um, not only that these things are safe and effective, but we'd like some information about relative safety and efficacy. And I think that's one of the, the advantages of having a uh, master protocol where you have many drugs under the same statistical framework is that then we can make comparisons between them. And so part of the problem with therapeutics of many different separate therapeutic trials is it becomes very difficult to draw comparisons between them. And there's a lovely paper about the amount of variation, variability in the treatments that were used in the, during the Ebola outbreak and how difficult it is to make any comparisons between them because of all of that variability. So. You know, I, I think, um, you know, we, we don't have a regulatory system set up right now to make an efficient use or to require efficiency in the, in the bandwidth of information that we generate. Um, I think we definitely need that. Um, and I think when it comes to the challenge studies, we need to evaluate whether they would add value in the context of the full trajectory. We need an apples to apples comparison of challenge study in what it, and then the rest of the development timeline Right? What else are you going to do? And compare that to an adaptive, uh, an adaptive trial, and then look at the bandwidth of information that we get, not just how quickly we get it. 
So in the interest of time, we're gonna move on to questions from the audience and I'll um, have Donal be the first respondent for the next question. And this is related to a few, um, so Jamie Webb and Govind Prasad both asked some questions that are related to sort of the ethical responsibilities of the physicians and when um, clinical judgment rather than enrollment in RCT has force. So Jamie Webb asks, how should the social nature of uncertainty be communicated to the individual physicians who will say that uh, for this individual patient, I could give them a 100% chance of receiving an intervention that I think is beneficial rather than a 50% chance in a trial, um, the judgment of other physicians be damned. And Govan asks um, a question related to sort of, um, especially when it comes to people, patients who cannot consent even by proxy, um, are, is it appropriate to think about the sort of justification for RCT rather than um, the physician's best clinical judgment? Um, I, I would say the, the key issue here is uh, whether uh, we really know that something is beneficial and safe. Um, so the, yes, the clinician um, has his or her judgment and they, have a, they believe that something is, is going to be effective, but um, why, where is that coming from? And it's um, get, at the point where we are now where there really is not evidence from rigorous studies to support that belief, uh, it's, it's a random chance that you get a clinician who believes strongly um, in a certain intervention and another who doesn't believe in that because there, there is a situation, you know, technically it's called clinical equipoise. We just don't know. And the, 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 uh, the other side of this lack of knowing is that uh, we also don't know what the harms are of the, the different options. And I think there is, we, we have an inherent bias, I think, that when we're considering an experimental drug, we tend to think, well, that's, that's my last hope. It's, it's the only thing that's going to help. And we have a, a kind of a, a positive uh, bias towards it. Whereas in reality, the majority of experimental drugs are harmful. And, uh, we, and that's been demonstrated you know, again and again with the track record of all sorts of uh, experimental drugs. Um, and so that's where uh, we, I think, have to, I think, humbly approach the evidence and continue to go back to the evidence rather than, you know, maybe um, a patient recovered yesterday who was given uh, something um, off label, but um, you could just as easily not be remembering the 10 patients prior to that who didn't recover. And that's the, that's the big um, disadvantage with, uh, with our sort of anecdotal reports and, and memories um, and the, the need to be putting together rigorous controlled studies to provide the evidence so that people can be confident when you go to patients and say, we have evidence that this is the better of the options. Um, and then we add, you know, we have to remember that then patients have the the, uh, the decision about whether they're going to accept that recommendation or not. Um, I'll, I'll echo that, I guess, in the expanded access and right to try context pre, uh, pre-COVID pandemic with um, Holly Fernandez Lynch and Amit Sarpatwari and uh, Robert Vonderheed at Penn and Harvard, um, we, I've made the argument that sort of this exact, those exact sort of points that Donal is making that physicians sort of have an obligation to, uh, that just because a patient may satisfy the criteria for expanded access or right to try doesn't necessarily mean it's the right ethical choice to um, encourage them to access unproven interventions. And I try to be very careful in my language that I don't talk about experimental treatments or experimental therapies. Um, or something like that, because they're not treatments, they're not therapies, they're interventions that are unproven. Um, and so, um, you know, we, I think it's important to encourage participation in clinical trials for all the reasons Alex has talked about. Um, it's important to sort of understand that 
um, you know, in order to promote patient under understanding and sort of truly informed consent, we not sort of overly hype or sort of be overly optimistic about the evidence that the reality is most things that are unproven interventions aren't ultimately shown to be effective. They may be harmful. They may just be ineffective, but you know, that um, we're not, it's not some huge, you know, we have to sort of be realistic about what the, what the chances are early in the research and development cycle. So the next question is from um, Ethan Schimoler, and it's um, addressed to Professor London and could go to others as well, but it's uh, related to the social value of the research. Um, so um, how can we think about social value um, in a way, uh, well, so social value can only be constituted according to particular political visions and paradigms. Um, how are those selected in a pandemic? If there are different political visions of what the research is supposed to be aiming at, um, how should we determine uh, what portfolio of research should be conducted in a, in a given moment, especially in emergency situations? Um, yeah, so I, I think that's that's a good question. I, I think these those issues are uh, inescapable since we have to ask effectively what are the ends that we want um, medicine to be promoting. Um, you know, I, I think um, uh, you know, at the same time, I think medicine has to be, research has to be closely tied to the decisions of clinicians. Clinicians and patients have to engage in joint decision making, but I think in a case like this, um, hard endpoints like, is this going to provide you a survival benefit? Um, uh, that the the social value in a situation like this doesn't have to be so grand in terms of what vision of the republic um, does this feed into, um, but rather, you know, um, uh, what is the notion, what is the nature of benefit that we're looking for in this intervention that makes it such that we feel like um, we should provide it to patients, uh, that we should pay for it in, in, in the health system, that it makes a reasonable use of scarce resources. So I, while, while in a pluralistic democratic system, there's always room for disagreement. I think these are a slightly lower level um, uh, question where it's really just about what are the concrete benefits that we would want to see a patient uh, have to receive in order for us to say, this is something that we really are obligated to provide to them. So another question comes from uh, Todd Barrett about um, a specific vulnerable population, um, especially in Ohio. So um, Todd would like to get input on prisoners with COVID. They're participating in many of the clinical interventions based on urgent FDA need and clinical care that is um, based on best practice, but it's really challenging to get data to participate in research. In many states, they represent a large portion of the inpatient population. So how should we think about protecting prisoners' rights um, and at the same time, uh, making sure that they also have access to participation in research, if that's something that we value. Um, yeah. So I think one interesting FDA wrinkle, or interesting to me, being you know very interested in FDA, is FDA actually does not have specific to prison to um, incarcerated populations. Uh, does not have research regulations specific to people who are incarcerated, unlike. Um, OHRP and the common rule, though I'll, I'll defer to, to others on those. So, you know, from a sort of purely FDA regulatory perspective, there isn't a legal reason why there's a barrier to including people who are incarcerated in research. Um, but obviously there are lots of institutional barriers. I think I saw another question in the Q&A sort of about some of the internal institution, institutional barriers, but I'll uh, defer to Donal and well, I think the one of the concerns with uh, involving prisoners in uh, in research is the, the the extent of coercion that they may experience to get involved, um, and also the history of using prisoners uh, to test, um, particularly cosmetics and other. Um, types of things where there clearly was no logical connection between using prisoners and the items being tested. 
So I would say that the, the first thing to be clear about is, um, is, the, is the prison population one that uh, will benefit from the results of this research? And I think clearly for the, the reasons even the questioner brings up, the fact that prisoners make up a substantial proportion of the, the people infected, that, that that would be satisfied. And so from that perspective, I think there would be, uh, to me, a, a good reason to include prisoners. The other part then is more difficult because then uh, do prisoners uh, hope that they maybe would get a shorter sentence or some other benefit if they were to get involved? And again, remembering that uh, a lot of experimental research uh, is going to involve things that um, you know, may turn out to be more harmful than having a, a, a true placebo. Um, and so taking those risks in order to get a benefit that uh, possibly uh, those of us who aren't in prison would say, no way, I'm not doing that. Um, so that would be the concern from kind of an implementation approach that I would bring up. So, um one plug is our next care panel is going to be on the ethics of research um, with incarcerated uh, research participants. So um, hopefully you'll find uh, details about that. It's still in the planning stages. Um, the final question um, that I think uh, is an important one to just ask for the panel is just sort of how to get uh, public buy-in to the uncertainty. So do the panelists have any recommendations? This is from Daniel Goldstein. Do the panelists have any recommendations for promoting the acceptance of uncertainty as a way to increase public buy-in? Will uncertainty help to engender more trust in the workings of research scientists? Could it undermine research um, and public trust? Uh, so, um, just let me say thanks uh, for a really stimulating event um, and, and for inviting me. Um, I actually do think that um, proper communication of uncertainty um, is really a key to mounting uh, effective research and persuading people that study participation is a way to promote the common good. Um, I think part of that is having a little bit more nuance than what we've been able to achieve currently, um, because you know, in, if you boil the debate down to does this drug work or not work, then you've lost all the, the, the nuance there between we're trying this drug for pre-exposure prophylaxis, post-exposure prophylaxis, for um, you know, treatment of, of people in early stages, uh, you know, saving, salvaging people who are on a ventilator and who are close to death. Like, these are all very different um, uh, hypotheses or research questions. The more that we can do to, um, to try to say, look, th these are the different questions that we're, that we're asking. This is what we don't know. This is why we need um, your help. I think um, ethically that's the right way to do things. Um, and I can't see how it would be worse than the situation we're in now. Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's spot on. I guess the other thing I would encourage uh, us all to do to the extent we're at academic institutions um, or non-commercial non institutions or allegedly non-commercial institutions is to you know, encourage ourselves and our colleagues and our press offices to talk about research, whether we're talking about COVID or something else, in um, non-hypey terms, <laughs> for lack of a more eloquent phrase. I think we we all contribute to the problem if we get over if we hype things that are sort of not uh, not not ready for it. Yeah, I, I, I think it's really important to keep um, doing this. And I think this is where the value of, of transparency and honesty is what will win out. I think trust is built on uh, those concepts, not kind of people realizing, oops, the, the doctor doesn't know what's best. Um, I think that, um, you know, to have the uncertainty laid out clearly is possibly what would help to, to build trust um, because then people will see, you know, okay, now, now I can uh, understand the situation and why research uh, is so necessary. Well, thank you so much, Alex, Patty, and Donal for participating in a thought-provoking and somewhat consensus-building um, conversation. And thank you to all the audience for all your excellent questions. 
Um, we are going to be, this is recorded, we're going to be sharing the panel and we'll also try and um, collect the questions and share those questions so that um,